When you look around Major League Baseball, we all know that there's always a random breakout player for each and every MLB team. Well, with all that said, the Nationals, they may have two of those just this year. You are Locked On Nationals, your daily Washington Nationals podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. And thank you all for making Locked On Nationals your first listen every single day as we are free and available wherever you get your podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Clary. You can catch me over on Twitter at RyanClary11 and as well as the show page at LO underscore Nationals for all your latest Nationals news and notes and tweets, whatever else you want. While you're at it, make sure to search Locked On Nationals wherever you get your podcast and hit that subscriber button as we will have your daily Washington Nationals content covered right here, right now. And today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On MLB for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Later on in today's show, we'll be previewing—not really previewing, but kind of getting into the futures of Jake Irvin and Riley Adams. As I kind of said in that cold open there. I do think the Nationals may have found something with each of these guys, but here's the thing. They do have multiple roles that they could be kind of getting into in the 2024, and I'll explain that as we go on today, but let's start off with Jake Irvin because, again, Jake Irvin, when he got the call up back in May, at this point, no one really knew what to expect with them. When you have someone who's kind of like your 18th best prospect in your organization, someone who's a mid-round pick, who's had Tommy John surgery in the past, there's not really much to expect. But as Jake Irvin, as he kind of got acclimated to major league pitching and major league hitting in particular, you kind of saw a lot of good things with Jake Irvin. There's a lot of good things to take away from the 121 innings that he threw this year. Number one, for the majority of the season, he was healthy. Yes, he did have a little bit of issues at the back end of that September, but even then, I kind of look at it as the same with Mackenzie Gore in 2022. There's no real problem with just shutting him down right then and there. Do I think that that's going to be a lingering issue for Irvin? No, I don't. Because I think we saw a lot that you can just kind of cling on to. And I think that is, is that he was one of the better pitchers down the stretch for the Nationals in 2023. And it really wasn't that close in the second half. When you consider a lot of different things. Number one. Josiah Gray was in that slump. From that time in August, Gray was not good. He was kind of falling back to his 2022 self, giving up the home runs, walking a ton of batters. But while all that was happening was also kind of the ascent of Jake Irvin because from July 31st all the way through through September 9th, when he had seven starts, and this was also right after the Nationals did skip one of his starts, that's when Jake Irvin was probably at his best through the entire season. When you consider this, seven starts, 39 and a third innings pitch, and a 2.75 ERA, only giving up five home runs in those seven starts as well. 34 hits, 12 earned runs in total, 14 walks, which is a little high. But even then, all the numbers that you really kind of want to see, like the slugging against him, was down to a 384. His on base percentage was down to a 305, and his batting average was down to a 233 in that stretch as well. Jake Irvin. When you kind of just sit back and watch him pitch over the course of the season, there's a lot of different things you may have noticed. Number one, he's got a nice little mix between his arsenal. And I look at kind of what he has thrown this year. Number one is fastball that he threw 35% of the time. This is something that you can actually work with because Jake Irvin, while he's huge, I think he's 6'6", he's got one of the highest extensions in Major League Baseball as we see speak here right now. Now, that's not the the best thing. It's not going to be like, oh, this guy's going to be a stud because of ex- extension. No, but it just kind of gives you a nice little peripheral of what he could look like down the line, meaning this is kind of something that the Nationals, that I believe, can work with, with whether it be a starting pitcher down the line or even a bullpen piece. But as we kind of got into when he did get called up, I always thought, like, this is going to be a bullpen guy down the line. He's got some good stuff. He can mix in his curveball and his sinker, and he's got a changeup that he throws every now and then as well. 
But beyond all of that, he showed this year that he is or could be a starting pitcher in Major League Baseball. Yes, I said it. Major League Baseball, welcome. Welcome Jake Irvin, because I truly do believe that he was one of the better breakout players for the Nationals this year. And while he had a 4-6 ERA and 24 starts, I don't really look at ERA like everyone else in baseball does. When you're 26 years old, two years off Tommy John surgery, last year you're rehabbing for basically the entirety of the season. And again, you're 26, someone who has had success down in the minors as well. You make that jump up to the major leagues and you don't get rocked around the way that sometimes he did, of course. But he did not get rocked, really, for a better portion of this season. And so when we talk about Jake Irvin and really what this guy has done best this year, in my opinion, was he actually did stay relatively consistent. While he had that nice stretch, really, from the entirety of August, those seven starts from July all the way through the first start in September, Jake Irvin had his ups and downs. He had his downs, but really... He had a lot of ups as well. And when you consider this, when you're a rookie coming off Tommy John, all the adversity that Jake Irvin has had to go through just to get to this moment in his career, I think it's impressive nonetheless. Because Jake Irvin did not just pitch against the Chicago White Sox and bad teams like that. He was going up against the Braves. He was going up against the Phillies, the Giants, all these different teams that were in playoff contention. Some of them still are. Some of them, like the Phillies, are playing for the World Series tonight. There's a lot of different things that we can actually kind of sit here and like from Jake Irvin, not just from his four-pitch arsenal, but even beyond all the numbers and everything that Jake Irvin has done up to this point just to get here into the major leagues. Because I think the whole question is around Jake Irvin heading into this offseason, it's not whether if he's going to be in the starting rotation moving forward. He's going to be in the starting rotation no matter what, in my opinion. Unless something happens in spring training, whether it's injury or maybe Jackson Rutledge just dominates and they give him the nod over Irvin. Whatever it is, I don't really think you can knock Jake Irvin off the saddle right now if he was going to get to be that fifth starter of this rotation. Now, it could be maybe a four starter, maybe down the line. Who knows? But from his one rookie season, all the ups and all the downs considered, Most of the time, Jake Irvin was relatively consistent. And again, the numbers, while they aren't wowing, they aren't like you're going to sit out here and say, oh my God, like this guy's got the stuff to strike out seven and a half batters per nine innings. No, he doesn't really have that. While he did strike out seven and a half per nine, that's not really what his game is. He's more of a finesse guy and gets soft contact, as we saw a lot over the course of this season. And that also kind of runs into the fact that Maybe he is just a bullpen guy. Maybe he is kind of someone that you put in when a starting pitcher is getting in a jam and you try to get him out of it by getting that slow ground ball over to shortstop or whatever it is. Because I think Jake Irvin did kind of prove that aspect of his game this year while he gave up one and a half home runs per nine innings over the season. Not that much for a rookie, especially for someone who never really had home run issues down in the minor leagues and as well as had a very low walk rate down in the minors. Now that came up just a little bit in the majors, having four walks per nine innings in his first professional season. But even then, Jake Irvin was good this year. And I think his ERA plus sitting at a 93 over 2023 isn't bad whatsoever. It kind of goes to show you that, yeah, he was a tick below average. But even then, all things considered, 17th or 18th best prospect in the organization, getting the call up to the major leagues, staying in the major leagues for basically the entirety of 2023 and making your start every five, six days. That is a success no matter what. And even then, looking at his ERA+, plus, which kind of just goes to show you where he kind of banks along all the rest of starting pitchers in Major League Baseball, being around average for a rookie, especially for someone who doesn't have the expectations of Cade Cabali or even Jackson Rutledge for that sense, that is a successful 2023. That is a successful rookie season for really anyone in consideration here because there's a lot of different things that we can kind of hold on to and like with Jake Irvin. I've already discussed, I did a whole show about how I think Jake Irvin's curveball is an elite pitch as we've kind of seen this year. That is something that he's going to continue to work on and hopefully even just get better at because he also has a sinker that I think really plays as well and he really liked to use that pitch over this season. 
He had a changeup that I liked at times as well, even though he didn't really use it all that much. I think that is something that he can still continue to build on. The key word with Jake Irvin is just build. He's got to continue to build up his stuff. He's got to continue to build up his arsenal and really kind of just assure what he is as a major leaguer. Because I think this year, in 2023, his rookie season, I do think that he proved that he can be a starting option down the line. But it's not all there yet. The ingredients are, you kind of see all the different stuff that you like, that you want to see from a starting pitcher. But if Jake Irvin were to come in and be a 4-5 or five starter for this team down the line, not just 2024, but beyond that, what a crazy good success story for this Nationals team, and which we need. You need guys like this to kind of come out of nowhere and be big-name guys, kind of take the reins and be a fourth, fifth starter, kind of like an Anibal Sanchez back in 2019, even though very different career, obviously. Sanchez is one of the better pitchers of that last decade, but you get the point. You need guys to come up here and kind of prove themselves and hopefully just luck in to something good because the Nationals, they do have some talent right now as we sit here today, but we all know the starting pitching is going to be one of the bigger question marks heading into this offseason and really over the next few years of how they can get back into contention. And we know this, it's going to be because of starting pitching if they can get back into that winning realm. But thank you all for making Locked On Nationals your first listen every single day as we are free and available wherever you get your podcasts. And of course, on today's show, we will be breaking down Riley Adams as he had a very good 2023 season before breaking that hay mate bone in his hand. But before we get into Riley Adams and kind of what he did over this really, really pleasant surprise season for him, let me tell you guys about our good friends over at Game Time. And guys, when we talk about Game Time, I want you to know why you should never have to worry about buying tickets for your next big event. And whatever that big event is, it could be a sporting event. It could be a comedy event, theater event, whatever it is. Game time is your solution for all those things because they have killer last minute deals all in prices. And also my favorite part is when you're running late to a game, you can open up that game time app and check the views from your seat. Is there any obstruction or whatever it is? That is why you need to go with game time because they are Always the best price, and I can tell you this, it is guaranteed. Last-minute tickets, flash deals, zone deals, whatever you are looking for, and of course, the views from your seats, and the lowest price is always guaranteed, and event cancellation protection and job loss protection and all that stuff just for you that Game Time provides. So take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time and download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On MLB for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply again. Create an account and redeem code Locked On MLB. That is L O C K E D O N MLB for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Thank you guys for making Locked On Nationals your first listen every single day. And of course, let's get into Riley Adams here. As Riley Adams, 27 years old, second year, or really two and a half years with the Washington Nationals at this moment. 2021 deadline shipped from, uh, not from Seattle, from Toronto all the way to D.C. for Brad Hand. And at that moment in time, we were kind of like, eh, what is Riley Adams really going to do? Because you don't really know all too much about the guy. Just kind of got here. But even then, in those 35 games that he played in 2021, one thing was evident. This guy can hit the baseball. And while it's not all pretty all the time with Riley Adams, even then, Riley Adams, what he did in 2023, he kind of just reassured why this guy could be something down the line for this team. Because in 2022, it was abysmal for Riley Adams. And again, when you are Kibet Ruiz and Riley Adams in this situation, it's kind of a really tricky one because we all know that Key Barrett Weez is going to be the long-term guy behind the play. At least that's what we think. But with what Riley Adams did this year, there's no denying that the fact is Riley Adams was the better hitter. He was the better defensive catcher than Key Barrett Ruiz. Riley Adams was very, very good. And it's not just by looking at the games and seeing all the different pitchers who pitch better with Riley Adams behind the plate. It's even more so than that. The numbers in the stat cast metrics and whichever one you look at, 
really kind of backs up why Riley Adams could be like this analytical savvy kind of guy that teams want on their team and not just for a backup catcher, but someone who could hold down the fort for just being a starting catcher. And I think the numbers really from what we saw this year, we, we talked about Kibet Ruiz just the other day, his defensive metrics were not good. Well, on the other hand with Riley Adams, his were very good. And even after starting off the year, pretty slow, he really built himself back up. And I think we kind of showed that over this, and really all the metrics that have come out over the 2023 season. Because so far, Riley Adams is in the 61st percentile as far as blocks above average go. Now, framing, again, something that Kibet Ruiz was also kind of poor at, 16th percentile. But here's the really good thing. He was in the 70th percentile as far as pop time goes, getting the ball from fir- from home plate to second base. That's not something. That is that is a big thing. That is a huge jump from Kibet Ruiz to him. Because when you talk about Riley Adams, it's always, well, Kibet Ruiz is the guy. And he is the guy, I admit. But at one point, we're going to have to sit back and say, well, if Kibet Ruiz is going to continue to hit for a 250 pace and a 770 OPS, which is good, Kibet Ruiz had a good season this year. I still like Kibet Ruiz. But the fact is, Riley Adams was more productive, not just defensively, but also offensively. And if you remember back in 2022, Riley Adams was sent down, number one, because he was struggling in the major leagues, and number two, they wanted to get him first base reps. As we all know, the Nationals, they had no first baseman in the second half of that season. They were hoping Riley Adams could be that guy, working down on it in AAA, getting some defensive innings in under his belt. That never came to fruition, and this year started up in the major leagues, was the backup catcher for Kibert Ruiz, and ultimately earned a lot of different scenarios coming off the bench, at whether it be pinch hitting, whether it be starting every few days behind the plate. Riley Adams played a very efficient role in 2023, and now kind of going in beyond that, what is his future here? Because I think that is the big question for Riley Adams now. We know the guy can hit for power. I mean, he's a moose after all. It's huge, thick legs. I mean, the guy is huge. I could say that more and more again, but he's a big dude. You know the power is there. You know that he can block now, and the numbers all back these things up. But even then, I kind of like to look at these percentiles and kind of where they rank amongst Major League Baseball players. And as far as his hard hit rate goes or sweet spot spread percentage goes, Everything that you want to see from a power hitter is there from Riley Adams because his hard hit percentage was a tick above average and his sweet spot percentage was way above average for one of the better ones in Major League Baseball, ranking in that 95th percentile territory. Now, his strikeout percentage was pretty damn low as well. His expected slugging, pretty low. Expected batting average, all pretty low as well. So here's the thing with these numbers that we can say about a lot of different guys. Riley Adams may have just gotten a little bit lucky. Now, on the other case, Kiba Ruiz, you look at these different numbers, you say he was unlucky. So there's a tale of two different stories here. That's really what it is when you combine Kiba and Riley Adams and what they did over the course of this season. Number one, Riley Adams was the overall more impl- impressive guy. Now, again, he had less, way less opportunities than Kiba Ruiz only playing in 44 games this year, generating 143 at-bats. But even then, he did a ton of damage in those limited at-bats, hitting four home runs, 21 RBIs. He walked 11 times, struck out 45 times. But even then, his slugging getting up there to a 476, it just felt as if that Riley Adams always kind of found a way. Now, that's kind of an overrated thought for some people, and there's no real stat to find that number and kind of say, well, how did he find a way? But we all watched the game. When Riley Adams was in and when he when he was healthy in particular, this team and this offense did really good. And it's not just to say that Kibet Ruiz is going to be this backup catcher. No, this is not what I'm saying. But we can also applaud Riley Adams for what he did this year because the metrics are the metrics. The numbers are the numbers. They aren't lying here. He did have a better year and a lot less action. Simple, in my opinion. But now it does kind of create a little bit of drama considering we're heading into this offseason and 
Kiber Ruiz, he's locked up for the, basically the next decade. Riley Adams, he's locked up for a good while too as well, entering his RB years here in a few years. There's going to be a lot of different things to consider with the Nationals catcher position. So let's kind of get into that as I got an idea for Riley Adams and maybe it's not the most brilliant idea, but with all that said, Riley Adams, he's a good ball player. I think the Nationals are going to have to find a way to get him on the field just a little bit more. So I'm going to tell you why I think that. But before we get into it, let me tell you guys about our friends over at FanDuel and October baseball is back tonight again. And you can make your postseason debut with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Join FanDuel today and you'll get started with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place your first $5 bet. Just visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to create your new account. Then you can get on in the action from the first pitch until the final out. Like tonight, you got the Phillies and the Diamondbacks at 5.07 Eastern time. Guess what? I am taking the Diamondbacks, even though I don't really have much faith in it. I'm going to take them on the run line and hope we get to a game seven with Philly and as well as game seven tonight with the Rangers and, of course, the Houston Astros. So head on over to FanDuel.com slash locked on right now. Step up to the plate this postseason with $200 in bonus bets guaranteed. Make every moment more with FanDuel, the official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. Now let's get into it as we're going to kind of look into this magic eight ball here and kind of discuss Jake Irvin and Riley Adams and both their futures because I think both these guys, they have similar circumstances at different positions because they were both highly productive. Jake Irvin, now looking into next year, let's start out with him. Looking into next year, as far as the rotation goes, Cade Cavalli is going to be in the fold at some point. Just looking at it now, you got Josiah Gray, Mackenzie Gore, Patrick Corbin, Trevor Williams, and Jake Irvin. That's your five, in my opinion, right then and there. Now, Cade Cavalli is going to come in. One of those guys is going to have to go out. Is it going to be Patrick Corbin? Will he actually leave this offseason? Will the Nationals buy him out? Who knows at this moment in time? I don't think there's any reason to believe that Patrick Corbin will not be on that opening day lineup come 2024 and even be in that starting rotation in my mind. Trevor Williams, on the other hand, that is someone who could be in the bullpen moving forward. And in fact, if it was up to me, that should have been done from day one when you signed him. Now, I know they signed him to be a starting pitcher. That's probably the only reason why he came here to D.C. was because he knew he was going to get that opportunity to start. And he knew that there wasn't really that many guys who could come up and take his spot right away. But over the course of the season, one thing came true. You cannot have Trevor Williams be a starting pitcher. And goes the same for Patrick Corbin as well. We knew that. We knew the answer for that, but now we also know the answer for Trevor Williams. He just is not a starting pitcher at this moment in time. He's not someone that you can go out there and have five innings pitch every single night because he's going to get blasted third time through the order. So at this moment, why would Jake Irvin not be in the rotation if it were to come down to it, because we all know Cade Cavalli is going to be in the rotation eventually, hopefully be a mainstay, hopefully be good. But where does that leave Irvin? Where does that leave Williams and even Corbin in that sense? Well, I think it's going to have to be probably Irvin at some point that they say, we want to see you in the bullpen and see what you can do in a limited fashion. But I say, absolutely not. That should never be the case. It should be Trevor Williams back in the bullpen because we know it. We know what we're going to get now with Trevor Williams. Over the season, we saw it. He ain't a starting pitcher. He's going to be a bullpen guy to come in to kind of just eat innings. The Javi Guerra's of the world and all those guys. We cannot see Trevor Williams pitch in a Nationals uniform, or at least be a starting pitcher, rather. That's a little harsh, but we cannot see him be a starting pitcher because that's not what he is. It's not what he's going to be. It's not what the Nationals need, in fact. We need bullpen help. We need guys who are going to eat innings. So I think you can find that role with Trevor Williams. Now, on the reverse side of it, I just need to see Jake Irvin in the starting rotation because he showed enough this year to where you're going to want to take a little bit of a longer look at what Irvin can do, because I've always said, I've always felt that if Jake Irvin can be a major league pitcher, it's going to be out of the bullpen. But as the season got on, as he got hotter, and as he just got acclimated to pitching every five days, 
one thing showed true to me. It was the fact is that he is a very good pitcher and he has the ability to be a very good pitcher. So with Jake Irvin at this moment, he is going to be in the starting rotation, but I don't know how long the Nationals really plan to use him in that role for. But another one that's interesting, Riley Adams behind the dish. One thing is true with this. He's got to get more at-bats. It doesn't matter however which way he gets his at-bats. He's just got to get up to the plate a little bit more. And as we've seen, he is the better defensive catcher as we sit here today. Now, I don't think Kiber Ruiz is going to be a worse defender than what he was this year. This is probably going to be rock bottom defensively for him because he is a good defender, at least at what he was recognized as back in the day. But going forward now with Riley Adams, how can you get this guy more at bats? Because we all know in 2022, they set him down. They wanted him to be a first baseman. That tells you right then and there what they think about him. Number one, they think he has the power to be and kind of hold down the spot over at first base. And number two, he's got the awareness that he can be a first baseman. Now, what went wrong? Because Riley Adams did not get a single rep over at first base this year. In fact, I never even saw any reports of them trying to make him a first baseman. But if one thing stands clear here is that he's got to get more opportunities because Another thing with Riley Adams is that his production fell off a good amount over the second half of the season. But with all that said, it still rings true that he is an above average major league hitter, at least he was over the season. You got to find ways to get him at bats. You have to find ways for young guys like himself who haven't really had all the opportunities in the world to prove themselves up in the majors. Those guys have to get their opportunities eventually and hopefully just hopefully find a way to get him in key situations. Because if you can turn Riley Adams into a first baseman, that changes a lot of different things for the Nationals. Now, it's not going to be something that happens overnight. In fact, that train may have already passed us at this point, just because of the fact he's 27 years old. And if they tried it last year, we know the Nationals at points this season needed some first base help. They needed a little bit more offensive production of that position, but we all know Dominic Smith, he held it down defensively. It was just too valuable. You can't really just throw someone out there to play first base. You tried that with Joey Manessis last year a little bit, and that did not go well either. Luke Voigt, it did not go well for him either. A lot of different ways that we've seen first base being played over the years that have really just not been good. So with Riley Adams, the reason why they didn't throw him out there, we all know, defensively. He ain't there yet over at first base, but that is going to have to be the focal point for Riley Adams moving forward because I don't see him getting any more reps than just being a backup catcher in Major League Baseball unless he were to be traded or maybe something happens to Kibert Ruiz and maybe we trade him. I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think it's in the cards whatsoever, but even then you have to find ways to get Adams more at bats. Maybe you move off Joey Manessis and trade him for an asset and make Riley Adams your DH and just hope that he can hit the ball consistently over the course of the season. But one thing is true. He's got to get more at-bats. you got to get this guy more opportunities, and hopefully he can have those numbers, but over a larger sample size, and I think that will pay a big difference down the line for this Nationals team. Thank you guys for making Locked On Nationals your first listen every single day. And on tomorrow's show, show, we will be talking about some of – the debuts of the Nationals over the course of this season and kind of get them and really kind of rank them. I think it'll be a fun little topic here because the Nationals, they had quite a few debuts over this season. Some of them were really good. Some of them were not so good. We'll discuss that on tomorrow's show and get into that as that'll be a fun, nice little way to talk about all the rookies and some of the successes that they had this year. So, of course, watch some postseason baseball today. Catch it over on SiriusXM. Listen to the broadcast. Over on XM, it'll be a fun time. And of course, go Diamondbacks, go Rangers, or go Astros. I don't know. I'll catch you on the flip side.